my dear friends and welcome back to another Star Wars news update. So today we're going to be focusing on the Andor show, but we begin with some major news for Ahsoka. Six weeks on from the original report from Cinelinx that stated Lars Mikkelsen is playing Thrawn in live action, the Ronin editor-in-chief Christopher Mark is now backing those claims, saying he's heard from a source that he is indeed playing Thrawn. So now that's two reliable sources saying the same thing, really exciting stuff. As I've said in the past, there's really no one else I can imagine playing him. Not only this, but Mark claims that Sabrax, the species of Darth Maul, are going to appear in Ahsoka as stormtroopers. The uniforms feature the colours of white and burgundy. He added that while he doesn't know for sure if Captain Rex is in Ahsoka, he's heard that Lucasfilm have major plans for him. The final claim from the editor-in-chief of The Ronin is that Ezra Bridger is indeed going to be sporting a beard in the show, something I speculated on a few days ago. So just a few exciting tidbits there. More than anything, I just want Lucasfilm to confirm that Lars Mikkelsen is in the show. In my opinion, he's the only Thrawn, but we won't know until Ahsoka has an official trailer. Let's wait and see. So this is the week that we're getting the sixth episode of the Andor series. We're almost halfway through Tony Gilroy's first season, and as such, today, we're going to be looking at some tidbits before episode six. So this really surprised me. Diego Luna confirms that there are going to be some time jumps within season one. As we know, season two is going to span four years, and season one spans one year, but that doesn't mean there aren't going to be some time jumps, some micro time jumps, in the remaining few episodes. So if you look at Andor season 1 as four arcs of three episodes, we're going into the final episode of the second arc, and afterwards in episode 7, 8 and 9, the third arc of the show, there could be a time jump there. And so moving on to our next Andor tidbit, I want to do a deep dive into something a bit more peculiar. Now bear with me, everything I'm about to say is relevant. So on June the 30th, 2023, next summer, Indiana Jones 5 releases. Now it's going to be a special film for many reasons. Not only is it the fifth and final Indiana Jones movie, but it's also John Williams' final cinematic musical score, and perhaps Harrison Ford's final performance as the beloved heroic archaeologist. Now the sequence of recent events is as follows. On May the 26th, 2022, the first Indy 5 image was released, then on June the 5th, Epic Games announced that Indiana Jones was on Fortnite. On September 2nd, John Williams debuted Helena's theme at the Hollywood Bowl. And eight days later, on September 10th, the first Indy 5 footage premiered exclusively for those at Disney's D23 Expo. Harrison Ford came out to greet the audience and was very emotional indeed, more than he's ever been for Han Solo. After all, it is notorious that he didn't really like the role. But at D23, he told the audience just how great this final installment of Indy is. Now, you might be wondering, so Meg, what does Indiana Jones have anything to do with Star Wars? After all, aren't you Star Wars Meg and not Indiana Jones Meg? Well, you would be right, my dear friends, but it's all very relevant because in Andor, we've now had a handful of Indiana Jones Easter eggs and I came across a really interesting piece by Collider who sort of contextualized why Lucasfilm are doing it and why it matters. The lowdown is, in the same fashion that George Lucas used to do, there's celebrating the company's wider filmography and legacy through easter eggs and references in the background of a completely unrelated project. And when you really think about it, in a not so subtle way, getting fans noticing these easter eggs, tweeting about them, talking about them on YouTube like I'm doing right now, is definitely a very smart marketing strategy by Lucasfilm to build up hype for Indiana Jones 5 next summer. So why does it matter? Let me explain. No, that didn't really work, did it? Let me explain. So the worlds of Star Wars and Indiana Jones are finally colliding in Andor, but not in the way you might think. If you were to ask someone what they thought of Lucasfilm, Star Wars would no doubt be the first thing they think of, followed by Indiana Jones and then Willow. The globetrotting archaeologist's adventures have become a big part of pop culture, maybe not as big as Star Wars, but still very significant, and until now, the two franchises offer a very different cinematic experience. While the Jones and Star Wars franchises have a few things in common, notably Harrison Ford himself, and or by Tony Gilroy pays homage to the famous archaeologist in its most recent episodes, and in the best possible ways. The recent two episodes of Andor, episodes 4 and 5, had plenty of Star Wars easter eggs, and I broke those down in my breakdowns and reviews. We spoke about how they're expanding Star Wars lore, doing quite a lot with the sequel trilogy in terms of easter eggs, as well as connections to the prequels, Star Wars Rebels, even Starkiller from The Force Unleashed, and so much more. 
but admittedly, while a lot of us were really excited about these easter eggs, some of us right off the bat noticed the references to Indy. The first is an item frozen in carbonite, and upon further inspection, the item turns out to be Indiana Jones's trusty bullwhip. The bullwhip is as much a part of Jones as his trademark fedora and pistol. He used it to grab objects, to swing from place to place, and even utilised it in combat. But a second easter egg which not many people noticed came in Under Episode 5, The Axe Forgets, and this easter egg is a reference to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. In Episode 5, when Stellan Skarsgård's Luthan Rail is shown listening to radio waves in order to keep track of Cassian and the rebel Sully's joined on Aldani, a pair of large shaped stones with strange markings can be seen on the shelves behind him. Said stones are the Sankara stones, which Jones was tasked to retrieve from the thuggy cult led by Mola Ram. The Sankara Stones, if you've seen the film, turn red hot whenever the name of Shiva is invoked, which brings great harm or great power to whoever's using them. Now, it must be said, this is not the first time Star Wars is paying homage to the Jones films. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indy boards a plane that has the serial number OBCPO. This number happens to be a dual reference to the protocol droid C-3PO and Obi-Wan Kenobi, and a wall of hieroglyphs in a later sequence depict R2-D2 receiving the Death Star plans from Princess Leia. Temple of Doom also has a not-so-subtle Star Wars reference. The club that Indy frequents in the opening sequence is called Club Obi-Wan, so it goes both ways, as The Empire Strikes Back also contained a pair of blink and you'll miss it easter eggs from the Jones films. When Chewbacca travels to Cloud City's incinerator room to find a damaged 3PO, the Ark of the Covenants can be spotted amongst the various piles of junk, and if you squint, Han Solo is carrying a bullwhip on his belt. Even though Raiders had yet to start filming at that point, George Lucas already had Harrison Ford in mind for Jones. And with Indy 5 releasing next summer, as well as plenty of Star Wars projects in development, I think we're going to see more of these easter eggs across various shows. So I think Lucasfilm's really having their cake and eating it too, relying on Star Wars to also promote the Indiana Jones franchise. I have no problem with it, but an understated reason I think it's amazing that Andor is doing this is because it really keeps in the legacy of George Lucas, and with so many Star Wars fans saying that the Andor series is the best live action Star Wars show we've had, in some cases right on par with The Mandalorian, then it's so important important to have that George Lucas essence run through its veins. Tony Gilroy may have said that he's not a Star Wars fan, and building up to the series, in countless interviews he did state that he's not doing it for fan service. he's truly done a great job at keeping Lucas's legacy alive in this show, and it does go back to the whole light-hearted thing, and all for the first five episodes has certainly been a dark, gritty, and adult version of Star Wars. So throwing in these light-hearted gems in the form of easter eggs gives fans the opportunity to kind of say, oh look, it's Indiana Jones' belt. Some at face value that's really silly, that kind of brings a light-heartedness to the series, and more than anything reminds us of the key to all of Star Wars, to really just enjoy it and have fun, and so for a series like Andor, which takes itself very seriously, those moments are definitely needed. Not everyone's going to catch them, but for the fans who do, it adds an extra layer of depth to it, and I've loved it as a fan. So now, my dear friends, some more tidbits for the Andor series. First of all, Sinta Kaz and Vel Sartha. Did you know that the first names of both these characters were inspired by Sintas Vel, the wife of Boba Fett in Star Wars Legends? One is called Sinta and the other Vel, but in Legends, as we know, there was a character called Sintas Vel. I just thought that was a really interesting tidbit. And so finally, my dear friends, for the Andor series, I want to give attention to something which I think a lot of times is obvious in the show, but is really being highlighted in interesting ways, and that is the incompetence of the Empire, but it's a self-imposed incompetence. They had everything they needed to clamp down on the Rebellion, the early Rebellion, but they didn't do it. And it goes back to something Cassian says in Episode 3 to Luthan. <laughs> They're so proud of themselves. They don't even care. They're so fat and satisfied. In a weird way, Palpatine's arrogance trickles down to other ranks of the Imperials. As Cassian says, they're also proud of themselves. They could never imagine someone like him could get inside their house, and that's exactly what we're going to see on Aldani. If the Empire was more proactive, they would have been able to stop Jin Erso's team later in Rogue One too. The only sensible Imperial we've met is Dedra Moreau of the ISB. She's sniffing out the clues, sniffing out the breadcrumbs, and she senses that something is off. She and her officer have located various rebel activities, and as they said, it's too random to be random. But as we see, she's not taken seriously by Blevin and her superiors. 
So in a big way, Tony Gilroy is building up this frustration which we as fans are going to have for these Imperials. He wants to show their arrogance and in many ways, the incompetence this early on means the Empire State are going to fail to control the rebellion because of how quickly it's growing. As Tony says, pockets all around the galaxy. I'm super excited to see what they do next. Episode 6 drops in two days time. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below guys. Are we finally going to see the heist on Aldani in episode 6? Share your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up. Subscribe if you're new and if you want more videos not found here on YouTube while also helping to support the channel, then click the link down there in the description. But until the next one my dear friends, may the force be with you always. I'm Star Wars Meg. Have a good one.